Welcome back to Matt Return. I'm AJ Piazza, joined alongside me, Evan Smith. And today we're going to recap Saturday's All Star Classic, Sunday's match against Drexel, and Bo Nichols fight in the UFC. What do you think the cl- tightest matchup was at the All Star Classic? Yep, I think the uh, simplest answer is the one that ended up going to sudden victory. That would be the main event match, Carter Strauchi versus Parker Kekaisen. It was billed as one of these biggest matches of the decade type. Uh, I even saw some saying modern day Dade versus Taylor, and it lived up to that billing. First period, there was no scoring. Strauchi, he controlled it mostly, but um, Kekaisen ended up for the second and third round holding on to them. The only scoring in the actual periods were escapes out of starting on the bottom. Then they head into sudden victory. Throughout the match, Kekaisen took his time between uh, stoppages, which the crowd didn't like, but came into a sudden victory with like a burst of energy, and it looked like he was in control, but then Strauchi essentially just got behind him, uh, singled him out out of bounds, and scored the takedown, ended up coming away with the sudden victory. And now he's kind of locked in as number one in that 184 class because Kekaisen's the national ch- defending national champion. Who else is going to match Carter Strauchi now? Yeah, and I I think that's the biggest takeaway from this is Strauchi's debut uh, debut at this new weight class for him, his more natural weight. But Kakaiasen was the national champ, and Strauchi defeated him. That should give Penn State fans hope with Strauchi maybe becoming the national champion at the national champion at this weight class. Yeah, it's undoubtedly the hardest opponent that he's going to face, barring any unforeseen breakouts. Season's looking strong for Carter Strachey already. Yeah, the the match I wanted to really focus on was one that we've seen quite often in Jesse Mendez and Bo Bartlett at 141, and the result seems to be similar each matchup with Mendez taking down Bartlett. What were your thoughts on that match? Bo, he talked all about mindset. I don't want to say he didn't seem like he had that confidence going in, but it was just Jesse Mendez was in control from the very start, it felt like. And then I th- his energy might have gone away when... Right at the end of the period, Mendez got a takedown that they were saying wasn't in time. Then they reviewed it, ended up putting the points on the board. The rest of the match, it was just Mendez controlling it. Like, honestly, it was not a great look for Bo Bartlett. Now, towards the end, he finally got himself into a scramble, but um, Mendez kind of just kept the ground leverage so Bartlett couldn't score. You got to hope, though, that mindset he talked about doesn't get faded by a loss to Jesse Mendez because he ended up starting the season the same way that he ended last season that affected him. Yeah, and another person who could maybe find themselves there is Tyler Kasak at 157, who also started the season pretty strong in what I predicted last week as my favorite matchup, which I thought would be the closest, and he came out with the victory. Yeah, Keller looked good after Kasak. He got a, a very early takedown and ended up riding it for about a minute 30. Since then, Keller tried to escape but um, Kazak was just on top for most of the match. He third round, Keller rode him out, but like it was three minutes. There was nothing to break there, so four to two. Not gonna say an easy victory for Kazak, but he handled Peyton Keller. Yeah, and the last Nittany Lion to wrestle was Levi Haynes, number two, moved up two weight classes from last year. It seemed like he dominated in this one. It was the exact same Levi Haynes that we saw down at one fifty seven. Maybe had had some concerns that he's going to be a smaller 174. Maybe he's not going to be comfortable. He looked exactly like he did. Control with the hands. Even without scoring in the first period, you could tell that he was in control of the action. And then he escaped immediately when starting on the bottom. And then the advantage to him was a stall point. Third round, though, it was all Levi Haynes getting that takedown and getting a near fall as well. So all good for Levi Haynes. Yeah, it seems like he'll be continuing the momentum that he built last season and even into the debut for the team this season the question was will some of these guys wrestle on Sunday since they wrestled on Saturday and he made his way into the lineup on Sunday we'll get to him but first let's let's recap that match against Drexel 41 to 3 victory what what were your initial thoughts as a the entire team wrestled in that match so it was interesting with that match where kind of the first half was underwhelming by a Penn State wrestling standard because they won four to five matches, but they were all a normal decision. And then you got into the starters because it started with Alex Facundo when they came out of that break, but then Mitchell Messenbrink, utterly dominant, gets a tech fall 21-4. to 
go into Levi Haynes. He does the same thing. It was what four or five straight tech falls at the end of the match. Yes, it was. It was five. So, not much more you can ask for out of Penn State. Not arguably a match against Drexel, where maybe most of the lineups not really motivated because again, Starachi Haynes already wrestled. But then you go down. I think the key matchup was Lucas Cochran going out there, taking advantage of that opportunity. What it's arguably that Josh Barr was supposed to be the starter. I don't think you can look at that match from Lucas Cochran and say he doesn't deserve to keep it in that spot. Yeah, no, and Josh Barr was ranked number 23 going into this match, but it was Cochran that, you know, we saw walk and walk to the mat and get the start. I don't know how you could really force him out of that. He he was dominant. He did his job. I mean, he could take over the starting job at 197. It's interesting nobody asked why Cochran went per se wasn't a question that was brought up at media or on Saturday. But the attitude around it does still seem like Josh Barr is penciled in as that starter. But there's an opportunity this weekend, Army Black Knight Invitational. Both of them will be likely going. You could even see a match between the two if they get far enough in the tournament. That can possibly be a deciding factor on who stays in the lineup. Yeah, and as we look at some other matchups, I think some Penn State fans were a little disappointed when you know the freshman Luke Lilladal didn't even really get a chance to show what he could do at that 125 weight class. But the big question mark is, again, at 133, Braden Davis, almost right into the match, got a little injured. What what do you think his update could look like? Who could take over at that weight class if he can't isn't good to go for a little while? Yeah, they basically said it's more of a day-to-day injury. It's not anything that's going to keep him out long term, so... It'll be interesting to see if they do put him out there on the weekend. I think they're going to hold him out just for the sake of, you know, you don't really need these reps. Uh, but Gary Steen behind him was a popular name when he popped in for a couple matches last year, but nowhere near the level of Braden Davis, so they're going to hope that he gets healthy as quick as he can. Yeah, and someone that fans expected to see on Saturday was Greg Kirkfleet, who didn't end up wrestling, but he did look like himself on, on Sunday in the heavyweight matchup. Yeah, Tanner up to graph. I believe he wasn't the uh, intended starter as well. So this was basically just him versus a punching bag. And Greg Kirkley did what he needed to do. Would have been more interesting seeing him in Saturday in a lineup against a more esteemed opponent. But he's got the rest of the season to do that, and we might even, again, see it this weekend. After watching this, you had guys at 141, Kale Nastio and 149 Connor Pierce make their starts for Van Ness and Bo Bartlett. Do you think they could poise as more competition than people would think, or you think this is just the one time they'll really see any time? Yeah, I think Connor Pierce is a talented wrestler, but just when you're behind a Shane Van Ness, especially Kel Sanderson talks probably higher Shane Van Ness than any other wrestler that we hear him speak of. And as long as Shane Van Ness keeps doing what he did on Saturday, I don't see a way for him to get into the lineup. As for Kel Nazdio, just the fact that you lost your one match likely is going to set you back. I know it's not something Kel Sanderson is going to be like, you know, intentionally keeping him out of the lineup, but he just didn't look good in his opportunity. Yeah, someone that had an opportunity, we, you mentioned before, at 157, it was a competition all throughout the offseason was Tyler Kasak and Alex Facundo. Facundo got the start. Kasak wrestled Saturday, which makes sense, but is there any chance that Facundo could push for a starting spot? He has some previous experience, but what what are your thoughts on that? He could easily push, but all signs point to Kasak just being the better wrestler at this point because they essentially have the same result. If I remember, they both just won their matches. Kasak did it against a much higher opponent than Alex Facundo did. So all signs still point to Kasak. Is there anything about the wrestlers that wrestled that changes your opinion on the expectation for Penn State season? Are you, I know it's a weaker opponent in Drexel, but is there any thoughts that you think could change with anyone or stick in the same way that they should all dominate? Yeah, honestly, it's, it seems like the same old, same old. Because the only match that was a question mark was Kel Nastio losing to Jordan Soriano, but Kel Nastio is not a wrestler that you're likely to see in the lineup in any of these important matchups. So, status quo for Penn State. All right, let, let's move on to the Saturday night with former Penn State wrestler Bo Nickel taking on Paul Craig in the UFC. I was able to watch that fight. He had cheers at the beginning. Then you entered the third round, and 
What was going on there, Evan? If the the switch in that crowd at Madison Square Garden was just hilarious. At first, I was like, "What are they doing?" But then they did it throughout the rest of the show. Where anytime there was like a lull in the action, they'd all just turn on them, to fight completely. So first round, chanting "Bo, Bo, Bo." We even hear a few "We Are Penn States" out of the crowd. And even though he's dominating the match, it wasn't exciting. So crowd starts chanting "Overrated." That poor seven and zero Bo Nickel. Yeah, from this match, uh, from this yeah, from this match, I I definitely take away that. I think Bo Nickel's a better striker than I originally thought. You haven't really seen much of that in his game in the UFC. What did you take away from this matchup? See, I argued that Paul Craig is easily the toughest opponent that Bo Nickel's had to face so Definitely. Far. It's not even close. And Bo controlled this match throughout. Everybody's mad that he didn't even try to go for a takedown, but I look at that as him being smart because you're handily winning the match. Paul Craig was barely even going on any attacks. And once you get him down, Paul Craig is one of the best submission wrestlers that Bo Nickel was going to face. He's got him outmatched in that. So why risk a takedown if you're going to end up getting a majority decision? Not majority. No, it was a split decision, right? No, it was like the whole. So he won the entire. Yeah, Yeah. I don't know what. Unanimous decision. Sorry, I was blanking on the words there. Um. So, yeah, it's not exciting, but when you're in your seventh professional fight against your hardest opponent and you're dominating, I'm not going to ask you for the style points. Yeah, that was definitely his toughest matchup. It was his longest matchup, and the the fans were a little impatient, yes, but there was progress that people saw that, you know, he's a better striker than you might think, and that's a tough opponent in Paul Craig. He's experienced in the UFC. The The biggest thing that I took away from this, other than the striking was headlining uh, a UFC match or a card really at the Bryce Jordan Center do you think that's ever possible like ever going to be possible or is that something Dana White would even consider definitely not Dana White won't even go to Philadelphia because it's not a big enough market so there's no chance they come to State College the only thing I could even see possible was Dana White is crazy enough to try to hold a UFC fight at Beaver Stadium and quite frankly, if you put Bo Nickel on that card and main event it with a super fight, I'm not going to say you could sell out Beaver Stadium, but you could get pretty darn close. I didn't even think about that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, definitely, I could so see Dana White doing that. <laughs> but I, do, I think that's the only realistic thing for the UFC. But White out UFC. <laughs> um, is there anyone that off the top of your head right now you could see for Bo Nickel's next matchup? Do you have any ideas or... Not off the top of my head. I'm not that deep into yeah. the UFC game. I was just, I was just wondering. Yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah, Paul Craig definitely was his toughest fight. He dominated the entire one, and I, I think I think the fans were a little unfair, a little unfair mm-hmm. toward towards Bo Nickel. But yeah, that's New York for you. <laughs> you got a problem? Yeah. Hmm. What a scrap. Uh, nope. Different episode. <laughs> D- different ep- okay. <laughs> episode. You even get the Bo Bartlett reference. Come on. I did. I, I got it, Evan Dole. Sorry, sorry, Mendez. <laughs> See, that's just that. Okay. All right, we're doing that today. Um, but, yeah, just to kind of go back to, the you know, actually Penn State wrestling here, is there anything that you took away from media that could really affect the outcome as the rest of the season goes on? Any Braden Davis update or anything like that? Yeah, not too much. Again, on Davis, it's more of a day-to-day injury, so I expect him to get held out this weekend. But other than that, probably should be the only match he's held out of. What is interesting is they're looking at the possibility of having a few unofficial wrestle-offs throughout this tournament where if Penn State wrestlers do good, they'll go against each other at a few weight classes. So it'll be interesting to see a few matches that I'm hoping that we end up seeing throughout that would be Lucas Cochran, Josh Barr, obviously. That'd be the big one. Down at 184, I'd love to see the freshman Zach Ryder go against Carter Storacci just to test his skill. Now, obviously, don't think he'd have much of a chance going there. And also, 157, you could see KSAC going against Facundo. Who are your winners in those wrestle-offs, other than 184? Because I think <laughs> we both would agree that Storacci would win that one. Right now, Lucas Cochran's impressing me, so I'll ride the hot hand and say that I can see him beating Josh Barr. And then down at 157, I'd still have to give it to Tyler KSAC. Yeah, I'm going to agree with you on both. I, I really think Lucas Cochran's going to be underrated in this lineup and overlooked because of the talent that's around him. Mm-hmm. At 285, you have Greg Kirkleet. And at 184, you have Carter Storacci. Those are two of the best wrestlers in the country. So I think he'll definitely be underlooked. But 
could be very useful for Penn State this year. Yeah, it's going to be a spot that they can have some depth in, which is good to see because there is a few other spots in this lineup where the backup wrestler isn't you know up to Penn State standards for Seth. Yeah, yeah. That will do it for this episode of the Matt Return. I'm AJ Piazza. Alongside Evan Smith. See you next time.